So as I said, I anticipate uh, this next discussion will be nicknamed Great Minds Think Alike. But if there's differences, uh, we want to hear about that too. Oh, don't worry, I'm not very shy. <laughs> right, no, I, I, you shouldn't be. Uh, don't go off the stage and maybe take it back a little bit face there. But, but, okay, if I go ask um, over tea kettle, you come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's on a hot mic. Okay. Um, but uh, there you go, you guys got the, the camera preview. Um, we are still here in the room. We are still having fun. Um, and uh, I'm so excited for that. We still have a great audience online. Uh, I don't see Professor Fukurai, but I do want to acknowledge that he asked a question that I think, although we didn't take note, but was answered. It was the question that someone else raised. Uh, I'm losing track already, but maybe Professor Johnson, uh, this question about, oh, no, Professor Levinson, the question about minorities uh, being portrayed in the film and those issues there. Um, so. Uh, and again, I will pass along. Um, we'll pass along questions and comments uh, at a later point in time. Uh, we have to make sure we download them, I guess, uh, to do that. Um, so with that, um, we are moving forward uh, to our last discussion of the day. Um, and I've already introduced Eleanor, and Eleanor will introduce Kat Brady. But I just want to say um, that throughout this is probably the longest we've been together and chatting although we've been in I, i've been in so many different events um where cat was uh was involved um particularly going back i think to the marriage equality efforts oh, yeah. um here in the state some years ago um and uh we're veterans just as mckenna um <laughs> etc et um and in this very room with a, a lot of events uh going on so um when we were putting this together and I was trying to bring in uh, someone who would be knowledgeable about what happens in our state, um, uh, the cat, was, cat was the first person uh, who came to my mind uh, and, uh, and remains uh, in that uh, first person position. I think one of the most knowledgeable, hardworking and, uh, and, and um, influential in a good way uh, people in our state. Eleanor, I didn't steal your thunder because you can give the details. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to make that note before we get started. So you, thank you, you Doris. The check's in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for still being here with us. Um, for those of you who missed it this morning, my name is Eleanor Roberts. Uh, I'm a recent Yale Law graduate, uh, soon to be public defender, and I uh, helped with the documentary uh, that we watched about. Um, and I'm very pleased to introduce Kat Brady, who is um, an expert and an activist on criminal justice reform in Hawaii. She has been active in the community, pushing for changes to Hawaii's prison system for over 26 years. Uh, and uh, she's originally from New York as well. Uh, and uh, she's from uh, from the Bronx. Um, and uh, as part of her efforts, she has always uh, focused on trying to make sure that the voices of people who are directly impacted are heard and uplifted, and that those voices and experiences inform the kind of policies that she pushes for Hawaii to adopt, which include decreasing overcrowding, uh, includes uh, addressing sexual assault that happens in prisons, um, and includes providing uh, reentry resources for people getting out of prison, uh, among many other uh, initiatives that she is actively striving for. So I'm very excited to have her, uh, to be able to moderate a panel with her. Um, and I guess the first thing uh, that I wanted to start with was for to ask her to tell us a little bit about how she got involved in this activism work that clearly drives her life. Well, it is my mission, actually. I'm from the Bronx originally, New York City. Um, and this has really been my mission because I grew up in a neighborhood where there were people on both sides of the law. And um, I saw justice issues from when I was a little kid. And I was always asking my mom, wow, why did that happen? And she said, oh, you get older and you'll understand. Well, I'm <laughs> older and I still don't understand. So, <laughs> so 
I, I started, I, in, when I was in New York, I've lived in Hawaii for about 35 years, and when I was in New York, I ran the Screen Actors Guild. And running the Screen Actors Guild, I ran into a lot of people who were actors, then got arrested, spent time in prison, and came out. And um, somehow, I worked a little bit with the Fortune Society in New York, and um, my work, my name got out on the street and all these guys who had been actors who were incarcerated and were now released were calling me saying, can you help me get back in the business? So I worked with a member of our board of directors and we actually started a little studio in the office. I found a little empty room and we built a studio and at night I was doing audition tapes for the guys who were just coming back. And I saw that they were just like everybody else. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Not everybody goes to jail or prison. So that was a big eye-opening thing for me. And um, when I moved to Hawaii, I was on the bus one day, and it was the kids were coming out of high school, and a bunch of kids were saying, oh, those blanking howlies, those blanking howlies. And I said, oh, I better go do some research. So I read every book I could get on Hawaii, the history of Hawaii. And I realized why people felt like that. Because Hawaii was invaded by the United States. And a lot of the Hawaiians felt disenfranchised in their own land. And um, so I started um, thinking about what could I do? So there was a village in my neighborhood um, that was started by a, a foundation, and it was for houseless people, people living on shelter. And I went over there and said, how can I help? And they said, well, you can teach people to read and write. So I did. I, went, I, I taught about eight hours a day adults to read and write. And then after I was finished with mom and dad, I would read to the kids. And it was such a gratifying, amazing, wonderful experience of seeing a village that had 55 little huts with only five families. <laughs> it was the mom, the dad, and one. It was the daughter and son-in-law and their kids and another. I mean, it was only five families. And I said, something is so deeply wrong. So I, uh, I'm a research nerd. And I always want to know what's going on and how did this happen? And when I started to realize that our prison population is a place that we put people who just don't conform. And there are some people who need to be, you know, separated and get some real treatment for whatever their issues are. But for the majority of people, like Roy said, they're really the A group. <laughs> and they're people who have struggled pretty much their whole life, and that struggle has brought them to prison. So um, I started working with women because I was trying to gauge the community to see how they would react. And when I talked about women in prison, they realized women are mothers, and that made a big difference to them to the community. So working, um, really working with some of the programs for women, we started really pushing for more programs, gender responsivity, because the prisons are all known to medium security violent men. They don't really know what to do with women. So the, one of the things that's so interesting is when they go to Halaba, which is our big prison, and say to the men, out of your cell, line up, the men do. What do you think the women do? They go, what about her? Where are we going? How come she's not going? So women build a community, and they want to know how come we're not taking care of each other. And that really got me going. And um, I've been working on prison stuff ever since. And we did get a gender responsive law. Um, which is sort of working, but it's something that we really need to understand that every person in prison is a human being 
and has some issues to deal with, like we all do. And how do we most effectively help people who will come back to society? And as I have said in the community, you know, the way we treat people in prison and jail, they're going to come and be your neighbor. So who do you want to be your neighbor? Your kids coming home from school on the bus. Would you rather have a guy who's fired from a day of work or a guy who's really bitter and angry? And they go, well, of course we want somebody who's from work. And I said, all of that stems with how they're treated in prison. So that's been my life mission. Thank you, Kat. Um, and I just want to put a little plug for PAC, but the Fortune Society, where you um, started out volunteering or, or working, uh, the CEO uh, was a Yale Law student who helped found the uh, Yale PAC partnership. And the vice president of programming is a formerly incarcerated man from the PAC program. So, uh, <laughs> um, so uh, Having that background, can you tell us some about some of the initiatives that you're working on in Hawaii right now? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to ban solitary confinement. We've had so many prison deaths, no, jail deaths of pretrial detainees. It is staggering to me. And you know, the way I think one of the main problems is we don't really have a correctional training institute. So we've had some problems in the department with the trainer. Um, and I think people are not getting properly trained. It seems that the main part of training is takedowns and cell extraction. That has nothing to do with rehabilitation. <laughs> it has to do with social control. And you know, I think some of our uh, People would love to see the Japanese guards doing like this, and some of the wardens would be like, yeah, that's what we need. We don't need that. We need people with compassion, people who have a heart, who realize that everybody makes mistakes, but not everybody goes to jail or prison. So we have to look at who's in there. And when you look, our prisons are brown. Our prisons are full of Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, Filipinos, Southeast Asians. That's, that's those people in our facilities. So when you look at, and, and most people are in for drugs or drug-related crimes, but when you look at drug use across the, econo the economic, socioeconomic spectrum, it's pretty even. But who are the people that actually go to jail? They're the people of color. So as a white person, I feel absolutely <laughs> it's my responsibility to say, look at this. Something is wrong. And luckily, I'm big and fearless, and um, <laughs> I have no problem saying that. And um, I think people need to realize that racism is really rearing its super ugly head in the last, with the last administration in Washington. And I think that's been a huge problem where, you know, people just feel like, oh, well, they don't matter. Everybody matters. Everybody has something to offer. And if we don't, if we're not smart enough to realize that we can learn from every single person, then something is really wrong with our whole educational and justice system. Thank you, Kat. Um, so I wanted to ask you, taking your background in participatory civic advocacy for change in Hawaii, how did you see the dialogue and the advocacy um, in both the documentaries? How did that relate to the work that you're doing here in Hawaii? Well, um, my first impression of the Prison Circle film was how similar the world is. And it's broken. It's broken because people in Japan are in prison for the same things people are in prison in other places. So the world is broken. And until we realize that,
and start to really work on a very granular level to get people to care about each other. We've become this sort of society, and I'm talking about America, uh, this society that's basically, I got mine, you know, good luck with yours. We, we, we're social beings. We need each other. And until we realize that, we're all doomed. So it's really important that we understand that the world is interconnected. So I think the, I thought the social control in the Japanese system was scary. And um, I surely hope nobody in the US system or any other system thinks that's a good idea. I think we really need to start treating people like human beings. And maybe if we had people with more social work training, people with more psychology background, they would be able to deal with people who are living in their most stressful situation. So, but I thought the Green Haven, oh, that gave me such hope. And I actually called the director of the department after I saw the trailer and said, wow, they've got a program in Green Haven that we should have. I mean, it's they're talking, they, they're working together, and it's men who are actually revealing themselves. Because we do restorative justice here. And I got to say, it works more for the women, because the women are more emotive. And, and more ready to talk. But the way that pact um, develops people's confidence and self-esteem so that they can talk about their lives, that is really powerful. Because one of the problems with prison is today, and you don't look back. And it's really important to review your life, figure out what happened, and how you change your life. And, you know, people like Roy, and there's, we have a law professor here who's amazing, Ken Lawson, who also served time. But these are people with lived experience. I can, I can tell you the numbers, I can give you the data, I can give you the research. These are the people who have the stories. These are the stories that changed lives. And that's why it is so important to center people who actually have been through that hell and come out the other side. We all can learn from that. I agree. Um, and one thing I wanted to uh, highlight that you just said was, you know, what we don't have in our prison system nearly enough of is people with social work training who are actually running in prisons. And a lot of the training is directed towards forms of violence. Um, and I was actually just talking to Roy during the break about the, just following up on the conversation about privatization. Um, while there are lots of private groups that come into prisons, you know, one of the big tragedies of privatization as it can happen in the American system is that private companies come in and their bottom line is the dollar. And uh, a, a lot of prisons that are run by private companies or prisons that are state prisons that have private companies they contract with that come in do enact just lots and lots of violence and so privatization might mean different things but unfortunately in the u.s where um, the bottom line is the dollar often uh when prisons are cutting costs uh the way that they're dealing with people is not by investing in social workers or uh professionals that would require money um rather uh they're, they're dealing with it by, by locking people up and, and uh not uh paying for those kind of services. Um, so can I just add yeah. something? You know, private, I don't ever say private prisons anymore because they're corporate prisons. They're run by corporations. And the bottom line is about money. It is not about helping people. It is about the almighty dollar. And Hawaii has been contracting with the former CCA, who changed its name to Core Civic. Same bad principles, no name. Um, since 1995, when we took a bunch of guys from Halaba at like 1 a.m. in the week between Christmas and New Year's and said, pack your stuff, you're leaving. And they pack their stuff, they take them to the airport, nobody knows where they're going, their families don't know. 
and um, they get shipped off to Texas. It's, it's like, this is another world for people from Hawaii. And now they're in a prison in Arizona, still CCA core civic, um, but it's like, I was amazed when I actually went there. The Senate sent a delegation and I asked if I could go, if I paid my own way and all that. And they said, okay. And I went with them and I was stunned. It's in the middle of the desert. It's like, all you see is, it's like an old Western. You see tumbleweed like rolling around the, the hard packed gray soil. And then you come to a place where there's a big, big cement building and that's a, one private prison, then there's one next to it, and then there's one next to it, and then there's one across. I mean, it's like private prison city, Eloy, Arizona, where the mayor works for CCA. <laughs> so one of the problems is when Hawaii contracts with them, they basically say, well, we operate the prison. So Hawaii has kind of a hands-off attitude well, they, they operate, we don't, you know, we don't operate their prison, it's their prison. And I'm like, no, it's our people, and they're coming home to our community, so we care about what they do. And it has been really difficult to get information, even about COVID. They lied about COVID, and it's just coming out now. They sent back, I think, uh, 100 guys, and 24 had COVID even though they reported to the Oversight Commission, oh, no, no, no infections in Arizona. Um, echoing that, I've seen in my work, uh, a lot of prisons say they have no COVID and they evidence that by not testing anyone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> eyes wide shut. So uh, one thing I wanted to actually follow up with that you talked about a little before was you talked about how restorative justice is working well in women's prisons in Hawaii. And, um, you know, to me, the uh, therapeutic community uh, that we saw in prison circles seemed to have a lot of elements of restorative justice yes. in it. And I wanted to, yeah, and I wanted to hear your, your um, if you could explain a little about what you think restorative justice um, means and, and reflect on uh, what you saw in prison circles. Well, there's been a lot of controversy about the word restorative because a lot of people have told me, I don't want to restore what I was. <laughs> so therapeutic, whatever name you call it, it's really important that you have conversations about what we do. It works on three questions. What was the harm? Who was harmed? And how can you repair the harm? So it's the person who actually is in prison who requests the circle. And then they'll call uh, one of us and we will and give us names of people who are in their support group. And then we call them and ask them if they would participate in the circle. And then there's um, people from the um, prison, usually the case manager or counselor. So the way it works is it's a circle and it's set up in a very particular way with the facilitator, at the center here, then next to the facilitator is the person who requested the circle. And then the people who are with the person who requested the circle are sort of lined up in like order of their, you know, the person identifies who they're closest with. So it's usually the facilitator, the person who's inside, that person's mom, um, generally an auntie or a sister, and sometimes kids. And let me tell you, kids can be really, really brutal because it's a very honest process. So one circle we did was with, um, with a guy who was in prison for drug dealing and he had two kids and the kids were living with his mom and his, with his wife and his wife and his mother did not quite get along. So we're doing this circle and everybody talks about the first thing, we keep it really positive. What are the best things, you know, that you see with your, you know, with this person? And mom usually says, oh, he's so well groomed. 
and and you know everybody goes through my you know the sister oh he always helped me with my homework i really miss him and it goes like that and then it goes around to the person who's the prison counselor and that person might say well that person has done really well he's involved in a lot of different programs and that's going to really help his re-entry um when it got to the children of this of this guy the kids were just you made me lie you you and mom told me never to lie and they asked in prison where is my dad and i lied i said you were driving a truck somewhere on the continent and you made me lie and, and you told me not to but i had to because of what you told me and this guy big local guy he just i mean you could actually see him folding in on himself and he just started to cry he went over to that little girl and he knelt in front of her he just wept and said i am so sorry i haven't been a good dad but i am i am gonna do really well and i'm never gonna forget that you said that well come to the guy's release date and he was a peer navigator in the prison group and he asked could i stay three more months because i have some guys that are really helping and i i don't want to leave them right now <laughs> And the guy actually overstayed his time to do something good. So I know restorative justice can work because you really tap people's hearts and souls. And that's what you need to do if you want to make change. Thank you. And um, all of that resonates to me with both films we watched. The, I thought Prison Circle captured it so well. And um, yes. uh, also one of the programs impact that we show clips from, but we didn't show audio from, uh, because it felt quite sensitive, was um, also a restorative justice circle that we didn't have with outsiders, but we had with um, Yale students uh, acting uh, uh, that I, I was able to attend, similarly to the one we saw in Prison Circle, where um, we would pretend to be the outside center. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned to me earlier today uh, about how family is really important in Hawaii and how that impacts the lens you bring to criminal justice reform and to watching these films. And I was curious if you could say a little bit more on how family informs your take on uh, what we should be doing with our prison system. Everybody comes from a family and everybody comes from a neighborhood and a larger community. And once we start, one of my problems with the criminal legal system is that we focus on the wrongdoing. And it's all about one person, as if that person is not connected to anybody else. And that is just not true. Everybody is connected to some. So I think it's really important that we maintain communications. And that is not easy. <laughs> We've been, there's, there's letters and now we have this there's something called spice and it's something that is liquid that they put on paper and then they write a letter and then when it gets to the prison I guess they smoke it um, so what the how the prison deals with that is that They've been opening everybody's mail, photocopying the letters, and throwing out the pictures that kids are sending to mommy or daddy, because that's, that's not good, they think. So people aren't even getting the real letter from their loved one. And I don't know how you deal with that spice thing and i don't know how you can detect if it's on the letter or what but just opening people's mail is just it is such an indignity you lose so much personal autonomy when you're when you're incarcerated and your connection to your family is so personal so it's it's been difficult and then during covid it was really difficult um, because of phone calls and in our 
jails and prisons, the phones don't always work. And that's been a huge problem. So communication is everything because everybody, 95% of the people are coming out and they're gonna be with their families or in the neighborhood. And how do we treat people? You should treat them like you're, they're your family. And everybody makes mistakes and they paid for their mistake. So that's it, it should be over. But we don't ever let people forget that. It's always, you know, a self-defining thing. And it, an example is, I have a friend on Maui whose son came out, he was in 10 years. His girlfriend picks him up at the jail, brings him to like a mall on Maui, and he's wearing, you know, tank top shorts, surf shorts, and slippers. After like 10 minutes, he said, I gotta get, I gotta get out of here. And she said, why? And he said, everybody knows I was in prison. She said, look around, you look like everybody else. But to him, it's that thing that we put on people. You're bad, don't ever forget that. And to me, everybody makes mistakes. And, you know, we have to be forgiving and loving if we think, if we really want to have a peaceful world. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up, uh, circling back to the documentaries and just ask if there was anything that, uh, based on your experience and why you were really um, yeah. surprised by, uh, or anything that, uh, you were just like, this is exactly what it's like in Hawaii. Well, I really like the part of all the people who got out and then we're having a barbecue. We don't allow that. We have a no association rule. And this is a problem. It's a problem for people who've been through therapy together or um, treatment, substance misuse treatment together. You bond when you're in those kinds of environments and then you're out you lose that contact and even though one of your mates is you know out also you're not allowed to associate that is a huge problem so we need to figure out ways that we can keep people who have um, successfully completed um, therapy or some kind of program so that they can they can bond together and help each other. And I think that's the thing that the prison system doesn't allow. Like in Arizona, we have a lot of people who are um, Micronesian or from different Pacific Islands. If our guys help them, all the, all the instructions come on the um, closed circuit TV. So if you can't read English, you're screwed. And, you know, when our guys try to help them, they could both end up in the hole, so in solitary or segregation, whatever euphemism they call it, it still is isolation. So there are things that we're doing that are just so counterproductive that we kind of undo any good thing that might have happened in prison by not allowing people to associate after. Just amplifying that, what you said about uh, how we're all part of a family earlier when anti-association laws, I always think about how important social networks are to success and by not allowing people to engage in them, we are cutting people off literally at the knees who are getting out of prison. Um, yeah. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I also wanted to ask, um, you know, you were just talking about uh, the language issues uh, that people face in prisons. Is, is that, I know that there are many languages spoken in Hawaii. Is that uh, a particular, eight, <laughs> eight uh, languages spoken in Hawaii. Is that an issue that you see uh, in our, uh, in, in the Hawaiian prison system? Well, it's interesting because during COVID, um, the guys were not, get, people in prison were not getting much information. So I thought, what can I, what could we do that we could hand out to people in prison? But you know, things from the community to be handed out in prison, oh, that's a no-no. They don't like that. So I 
created something. I just went online and looked at, you know, CDC and all different websites and pulled out questions and answers. And I created a, I called the prison first and talked to the director and said, could I do this? And he said, mm, let me, let me do, let me see it. So I said, okay, I'll put a draft together and I'll send it to you. So I, he said, it can only be one page. So I said, okay, so being an activist, I had one page, but both sides. And, we, <laughs> and um, I sent it to them, but I didn't take, I didn't put our name, I didn't put Community Alliance on prisons or anything, because I didn't want anything to disrupt it. So I just wanted the people to get the information. So I sent it to them and they actually approved it. And I said, well, how many copies do you need? And they said, oh, like 4,000. I was like, oh, okay. And, <laughs> and then I did a little bit more talking to other people and they actually printed it themselves. <laughs> so it, it went throughout all the prisons and that was really, and jails, so that people knew what was going on because they were only hearing bits and pieces on the news and they really didn't know what was going on. And the one thing about people in prison, they care about their families. <laughs> so they wanna know what's going on because they have kids, they have, you know, families and they wanna make sure their families are safe. So that was a, that was a good thing, but an unusual thing. And unfortunately, this director is retiring in December. And I don't know, I'll have to start over. <laughs> so it sounds like you have um, a relationship with the people who run the Hawaiian prison system. How, how does that influence your work? <laughs> well, sometimes they go, oh, come on, Kat, did you have to say that? And I say, yeah, I really did. I'm really sorry. The truth is really important. And, you know, you can spin it any way you like, but it's really important that people know what's going on since we, this is all being done in our name. We're paying for this. So we should know what goes on inside the prisons. The reason I have a good relationship now is because the person who's the director currently, um, he was, uh, in the paroling authority, he was a member of the parole, not, not on the board, but he worked for the paroling authority for a long time. So I've known him a long, long time. And he's seen me when I was really green, going in asking for stuff that was just never going to happen, but I kept asking anyway. And I think over the years, he's seen that, you know, I haven't given up. Community Alliance, Alliance on Prisons is the nonprofit group. We have no money. All of, all of the people who work with us volunteer. And it's because we really care. And, and we're not going to stop. So I said, you know, I'm going to be testifying in front of your children one day. And you know what? I am today. I'm testifying against the child of somebody I testified for 20 years ago. <laughs> Sounds like a small community. Um, <laughs> um, I, I wanted to think um, more broadly about how we've just heard, um, you know, my context where I'm coming from is I, I the East Coast and New York is uh, far away from Hawaii. And uh, now we've also heard so much about Japan. So uh, the Japanese criminal justice system, you know, thinking in these kind of cross national, international, interstate, uh, in our community ways, what do you think we can all take um, away from each other from what we've learned today that would allow uh, all of us to continue to collaborate to make uh, the Japanese uh, and American, you know, both in Hawaii and New York and other state criminal justice systems, uh, you know, more just? Well, I call it the criminal legal system because I haven't found much justice, actually. So um, I think one thing that we learned is that the world is really small and we're all suffering from the same kinds of challenges. And we really have to acknowledge that poverty is the predictor for recidivism. 
it is, you know, if we don't, if we don't lift our people up, <laughs> we're never going to get ahead. So to me, it is really important that we understand, you know, when you walk down the street and you see a person who lives unsheltered, say hello, acknowledge them, see them. And to me, that is the most important thing. Um, I want to say something that I heard on the trailer for the PACT thing, and it was one of the gentlemen in PACT, who's the secretary now, Mario Castro. He said something that just, it brought tears to my eyes because it was so perfectly said. And I'm going to screw up the way he said it, but the gist of what he said was, you know, I work with people who work on the outside. They treat me just like everybody else. To me, that meant everything, he said. And that just really struck me. Because when we start bifurcating society or slicing and dicing society, oh, the, these people are here and those people are, no, it's one world and we're all in it. And we need to take care of each other. But I did want to say um, one thing, and that I was talking with Eleanor earlier about um, education in prison. And you know, in Hawaii, we think education is getting people a GED or, you know, uh, maybe some college courses. Actually, in Hawaii, we have master boat builders, fisher people, carvers. You know, hunters. We have people that that are the backbone of our of many of our royal rural communities, and we need to honor that. So I want to see education broader. And one of my ideas is I would love to have a grad student like who's working on oceanography or electricity or engineering once a month have a grad student go into Halava prison, which is our biggest prison, and um, talk about what, they, what they're studying and really start to light up people's minds like, wow, I'm a surfer, I can, I can do that. And that's what we need to do. We need to really connect people to our community and the people in our community who are masters not just academics. And I love academics because without you guys, I would be screwed. I mean, I, I totally count on all the research. I'm a, um, I write really um, technical testimony for the big bills that I work on. And it's all footnoted and researched. And I think that's, I really want to show the legislature, this is really how you run a, a, a facility. Thank you so much. Do we have time for more questions? Um, if there's a question on what we're doing now, go for it. And then we're actually going to open up the floor a little bit for, for further discussion. Anyway. Oh, Anything in particular for, for Kat? Or... Yeah, does is anyone in the audience would like to ask Kat um, or me a question? Uh, or if anyone online has a question, I have to monitor in the chat. So the, so we can also wind you guys down. I mean, this is essentially the time, and I will moderate from from down there for the audience and also online. Okay. So yeah. You want to just say thank. Thank you so much for being. Here. I want to thank you guys again. It it is amazing that we still have a crew here. Um, you guys were terrific. I am looking. Oh my gosh! Look. You, you guys are terrific. Uh, I, I don't know where the camera is, but you guys are terrific. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, there's um, I, uh, the. We still have a crew out there, and I'm I'm not sure how many people may have walked away from their computer, but I'm assuming a lot of you are still there, and uh, so grateful to you for that. Um, so we can. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is um, give a little more conversation because so much of this has been from the stage. You guys are good. Um, so thank you. You guys. Um, really um, uh, although, um, why doesn't my my lead collaborator come on down to the stage? Because we'll get you and come on down. 
This wouldn't have happened without Professor Ibuski and our eight years of collaboration uh, in, in this kind of work. Um, next year, we may not do it on quite this scale, um, but uh, in the future, we will. Um, but um, I, I, I do, I, I actually, I have a couple thoughts, but I'm going to hold them for a moment um, to share, to open, see if there's comments, especially from people who haven't had much to share uh, or not been on stage. Um, and then the other one is from the audience. And the last thing I would say with the, those of you in the audience um, is uh, um, if you prefer to post in Japanese, we've actually got bilingual capacity here. Um, so we could make that work. And the same thing for people in the room. Um, so uh, Sarah is monitoring and uh, Justice McKenna. We'll let you speak in English though. <laughs> you can pause. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, I recently started following this Twitter string by Professor Jennifer Taub, T-A-U-B, of Western New England School of Law who was responding to somebody on Twitter, but it's like this really long thing, so I recommend you guys read it. But what she talks about is when we define crime, first of all, and what criminals are, we're actually excluding a lot of criminals, and it's the white-collar crime. And, you know, like, we see so much white-collar crime, and crime by people in power, but the people in power are committing all kinds of financial crimes, um, but are not being prosecuted for it. And so we need to think about what is crime. Um, so I, I, Jennifer Taub, T A U B. I recommend that you follow her on Twitter, and I think she has a lot to say. That's just what I want to say. Thank you. Excellent. We'll let Keiko run that mic. Other thoughts or comments? Well, while it's quiet, I'll share mine, and then Eleanor will come back to you so we can get the mic over to Eleanor. Um, I just want to, one thought that struck me from today's uh, conversations is we were on the right priority, which is focusing on incarceration and, um, and issues surrounding incarceration and post-release. Uh, that said, um, I guess speaking from personal experience, um, I don't want to miss the other another piece of what I think is so amazing, at least about the Greenhaven uh, project, and hope might find development elsewhere, which is the role of that it has in legal education. Um, or other aspects of higher education. Uh, I'm not sure we want to be sending high schoolers uh, into uh, prisons. But um, we have where the American legal education model is accustomed to clinics uh, where you represent clients in, and including criminal defense as well as prosecution in, our, in many schools. Um, but this model, I mean, the first class I taught in the, the first law class I ever taught was in that classroom you saw on the screen today, right? That was the first place I ever taught a law class. Um, and that I was going there with um, future lawyers, prosecutors, judges, legislators, uh, and defense, of, well, in the lawyers includes defense attorneys. Um, one session we had, um, Chris, it was, I think it was Chris's la Chris Stone's last uh, session in his third year before graduating, was he convinced one of his classmates who had accepted a job with the Southern District of New York, and Eleanor will know because she'll be meeting those people. Um, but that's the um, those are the federal prosecutors in Manhattan, and uh, so we get there and we do you know we have our thing, and then um, be, and then at some point essentially Chris outs him and says I just want to and, and I you know I want you to know he's going to be a prosecutor in about four months time. And here we are in this room of, <laughs> look at Roy's eyes, right? He's picturing it because here we are in this room uh, of uh, men who have been prosecuted and incarcerated as a result of that prosecution. And Chris said to them, what do you want to tell them? 
And so the second half of our event was that discussion, right? And it was rich, it was so rich for both sides. And um, I don't know whether that individual knew it was coming or not, but he was fine. We all went out for pizza afterwards. Um, although I think he was maybe about as pale as the wall behind me um, <laughs> while it was happening. But I guess that's that's part of what um, I think. Again, in my opinion, it is secondary to what we're what we've been focused on here. But I don't want to miss it. That I think there is so much to be said because now with the the Greenhaven project being you know more than forty years on, there are hundreds of uh, people who have come through that program and um, had it uh, help shape their uh, their visions of uh, society and the law and what you do with that awesome responsibility that comes with uh, being legally trained and uh, and likely being a lawyer, judge, prosecutor. Eleanor, you got the mic. Um, I was just going to pick up on what Justice McKenna said and uh, mention that in, in the films, you know, in, in the prison circle film, the crimes we saw who uh, were uh, involved in the politics. Sorry, I don't know what that was. Yeah. I, I can just speak louder. Oh, oh, it's here. So in the in the prison circle film that we saw, uh, the crimes we saw people uh, being incarcerated for. Uh, among ones that included violent crimes, there were also, sorry, I don't know if this work. Um, has got a the better mic. Oh, uh, uh, th there were crimes like robbery, and I, I've thought about that a lot in the prisons. If, if the biggest form of robbery is wage theft, um, but, you know, no one's in prison for wage theft. People are in prison for uh, street robbery, and so the people who are uh, being being arrested for stealing are, are the people who what means, not what means. Um, just echoing what uh, Justice McKenna had said. We'll give that over, and then Makoto's going to be next. Sorry, and another thing, I think, you know, a lot of people here know, but I wanted for the people that are not aware, um, I encourage you to look at the prison policy projects, annual reports on the state of incarceration. And it talks about incarceration rates throughout the world. And um, America, as you know, is the um, most highest incarcerating country in the world. And as of last year, we had 664 out of every 100,000 people in the United States are in, in incarcerated. And a huge difference, Japan is one of the lowest. It's 38 out of 100,000. Hawaii is at 443. If the um, if each United States state in the United States was a country, the 34 most incarcerated countries in the world would be the United States within the United States. And for example, Louisiana incarcerates more than one percent of its population. I mean, it's crazy. And Hawaii is at 443. So we're really not doing that much better. Um, so. In any event, uh, the ABA just passed a resolution, Resolution 604, on the 10 principles to reduce mass incarceration. Uh, we're hoping, I'm on the working group that proposed that, and I'm hoping um, that the word on that gets out, and there's, um, you can look at it, just look it up, ABA 10 principles to reduce mass incarceration. I mean, it's just a step, but you know, we, we've got to start somewhere to reduce the incarceration rates in the, in the United States. So, Makoto, do you want to talk? And then also I'll note, uh, Corey has raised a hand, but um, I'm not so sure how to get you to speak. If you can post Corey into the Q&A, there should be a Q&A place on your Zoom screen. And Melissa has said hello. And Melissa, if there's a question behind your kind greetings, uh, that would also be helpful for us. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two points. The uh, first is uh, public education for learning about the prison. So, uh, for this purpose, uh, the prison circle, the Dr. Sakagami made this time, uh, is uh, one of the greatest uh, resources. So, before that, uh, we, we didn't have uh, any uh, documentary film uh, 
catching the real life of a prisoner. So Professor Goto explained before. So uh, it is a nice tune for uh, public education. So uh, we have to make more uh, cinema uh, showing uh, in Japan. Uh, uh, she is still uh, uh, working for the uh, promotion of the film, I, I believe so. And uh, uh, in, uh, for this purpose, uh, I, I have uh, been taught to the student in my class as inviting a former, a former prisoner because we, we ha uh, didn't have a, a good uh, documentary film. So, uh, as uh, Professor Goto explained, uh, in Japan, the, uh, most uh, former prisoners hide, hide their story uh, for protecting his, you know, uh, but, uh, 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 their life. But uh, some of them uh, show, uh, shows their story. So, the, fortunately, I had a uh, friendship with uh, former prisoner. So, his story, uh, a very personal story, but uh, it is very good uh, uh, education to my, my uh, student. And uh, for the public, there are a lot of uh, uh, books by uh, former prisoners. But I'd like to introduce uh, one of them. Uh, this is uh, uh, this was uh, by the former parliament member <laughs> who was in prison. Uh, he wrote a book. Uh, it's a uh, prison diary, probably English title. Yeah. In, in in Japanese, Gokusoki. So it made uh, uh, good uh, public education uh, for understanding the prison situation, especially. Uh, not only public, but also the, the bureaucrats. <laughs> bureaucrats started to uh, start understand how broken <laughs> the Japanese prison system. So we have to uh, <laughs> change something. So it was a good uh, uh, moment for, uh, for pushing uh, reform in the Japanese prison. So, uh, the publication or filming or education, uh, those are very important for, for uh, change the uh, prison in the future. Okay. A second thing I would like to talk about uh, education in prison. So, uh, today we watch the uh, film and the land uh, of the pact, the Green Heaven Project. But, uh, in, in, in the world, uh, there are lot, lots of similar projects uh, between the prison and uh, higher education institute. We call it the Inside Out uh, Prison Exchange Project. So you can, you can check uh, this term on the uh, Wikipedia, but uh, I uh, introduce it shortly. Uh, this, uh, Wikipedia says, <laughs> since 2004, the Inside Out uh, I'm sorry. Uh, since 1997, more than 600 inside out courses have been held around the world. Uh, nearly 100 higher education institutes, ranging from small liberal arts colleges to large research universities to local community colleges, sponsor inside out courses. Uh, courses uh, span the uh, uh, so small. Uh, <laughs> humanities and the social sciences, uh, African American studies, uh, uh, criminal justice, uh, drama, uh, economics, education, English, uh, gender studies, blah, blah, blah. So the, uh, I believe that even in Hawaii, you can uh, uh, have a similar project. Uh, so I, I hope really so. So the, this uh, innovation, uh, in the uh, uh, prison, not only in the United States, uh, Canada, but also Canada, Australia, Denmark, United Kingdom, and Mexico. So they developed uh, such a uh, program in, in the uh, prison. So uh, I 
I hope <laughs> in Japan <laughs> we can have this program. Uh, but, uh, at this moment, it is not being possible, uh, not possible so for us. But uh, we we covered uh, this uh, program in my uh, journal from uh, research center uh, for yeah, therapeutic jurisprudence. But uh, there are a lot of English materials uh, covering uh, inside the exchange program. So uh, uh, for for the English readers, you can check the materials. So these are very. Uh, eye-opening uh, project uh, for, for reformation purposes. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I handed my life. Anyway, I handed the mic to Roy uh, to see, and uh, Makoto, uh, why don't you, Kaori, do you want to add further comments before we wind up today? So, um, but Roy, why don't you go ahead and share your thoughts on today? Uh, so what I wanted to do was piggyback on what Dr. Makoto was just speaking about as far as the education is concerned, um, which is a very, very important uh, component of rehabilitation. Uh, in fact, it's so important that the Norwegian government actually incorporated education in the rehabilitative program and amongst many other things as well. And today they have the lowest recidivism rate in the world, which is 20%. Um, and when you look at it, they had the superintendent from Attica Correctional Facility in New York State, which is the worst prison in the state, even to this day after the riot, go over and observe the programs. And as he walked up and down the halls, he started saying, no, why is this officer speaking this way? He isn't supposed to conversate with these prisoners. You know, why are they allowed to walk this way? Why are they allowed to dress this way? No, this is not good. Blah, blah. Everything that he said, was a pulse of how the system would run in the United States with prisons of concern, which explains why the recidivism rate is approximately 60%. And the, the Norwegian government was like, how could you come and tell us anything when we have the lowest recidivism in the world? You know? And he couldn't explain it. But that's the importance of education. It's really important. And along the lines of being in the trenches, again, which is definitely a phenomenal uh, piece of knowledge and wisdom that I that I have. You know, nobody wants to go through that. But you fall down at your lowest point and you find your way back up. And when you find your way back up, you pull so much wisdom, so much experience, so much knowledge that books couldn't possibly give you. And at one point inside of my incarceration, I hammered out a, a book, right? And I, I had self-published it. And I didn't have a computer. I didn't have publishers. But I wanted to give the world a glimpse of what was inside of my head. This is prior to me getting involved with Pat. This was actually an HIV prevention program that I, I had found a way to institute a college program. I built it, taught several courses, uh, proctored exams with the help of the education department and the facility. I got convinced them to help me. Um, and I asked the superintendent through a proposal, could you allow me to bring an inexpensive college program into the facility? I, you know, I put myself through it, I can do that. He said, no, absolutely not, because they had taken all the college programs out. And they had an apprenticeship program through the Department of Labor that increased the chances of individuals gaining employment once they're released. So in order to be able to run that program, which the facility wanted, they also had to have at least two or three college courses. So through ingenu ingenuity, what I did is I found a way to instate the college program covertly. <laughs> and when it started running, lo and behold, who walks the hall about two years later with all of his superiors talking about, oh, this is Mr. Bowles. He runs one of the most best college programs in the facility. And, and I looked at him and I said, you're really a politician. In my mind, I said, I didn't say that a lot. In my mind, I said, you're really a politician. Now he wants to champion the cause when you deny my proposal, you know? But I had wanted to give the world a glimpse of it. And to me, it's kind of mediocre because I couldn't do it on computer and I had to hire my own editor. I didn't have a lot of money to do it. But I had did it and I wanted the world, the world to see what it looks like to be a humanitarian type individual when you help human beings through the worst times of their lives because it brought down violence in the prison. The guards will always say, man, the guys who are in the program during college, they know how to talk. They know how to communicate. 
You know, this is really good here. I love this right here. You know, and then you have the gung ho. This is like, no, no free college. My kid have to pay college loans. They know, you know. So it's always two different sides. But I wanted to highlight the fact that you said education was very important, and I'm a walking personification of that. You know, because when it was all said and done. It was the governor who was like, who is this mask, man? Get him about it, you know? So I just wanted to say that. And thank you again for this conference, all of you, and you too, Mark. Um, I had limited copies of the book, so I just wanted to tell you that I think I will go ahead and give them to the speakers and moderators, um, just to give a contribution and a gift to you all for all your efforts, all your work, and some a piece of me to remember me by, because the pack book is going to follow, and that's going to be the best seller, all right? <laughs> Have a good night. We are just about there. I, uh, Melissa has posted a question, and um, it, I think it is targeted. Roy, if you could send the mic that way, because it's targeted um, probably to Kat and Ashley and David. Um, and uh, Melissa, we are so thrilled that you are here. Um, and it says, today has been so informative and has felt like a call to action. But is there anything as undergraduates at UH Manoa we can do or in any ways we can get involved with the local prisons? And this is one of your students. And Kat, I'm also thinking you may have input as to how uh, a, a UH undergraduate student. And again, Melissa, thank you so much for being here and for sharing that. Yes, I do have something. Sure. You can testify at the legislature. There are, I have a big list, and I, I uh, put post hearing notices and bills with a little description and sometimes a few talking points about them. Um, testimony is so important because there are bills that pass that are really kind of dumb but have a lot of testimony. <laughs> and that sways them. So it's really important that people come out, especially about prisons. And when they hear um, students testify, it makes a difference because they realize that one day you're going to be replacing them. <laughs> so it's really, it's really important to get your thoughts out there and ask questions. You know, why do we do this to people? When people have a public health problem, how come we use a criminal legal system solution? Does that help for public health? So it's those kinds of things you want to keep posing to policymakers. Um, the other thing is I'm working on a, 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 an initiative for voting in jail. Every person in jail who's there for a misdemeanor has the right to vote, but a lot of them don't know that. And I think it's really important for I'm trying to put together a team of people who will actually go into the jails to explain to people why voting is really important. It's about not just you and your life, but your family, your neighborhood, and you know the world. So um, anybody who would like to participate in that. My email is cat, K-A-T dot C-A-P for Community Alliance on Prisons, H-I, Hawaii, at gmail.com. We're looking for people who are actually going to go into the jails and talk to people. That well, will make a huge difference. That's a square, square. Edward, I could get you set up. And anybody just needs to know how, I mean, even if you didn't get the code word, um, all you got to do is Google cat with a K Brady, Hawaii in prisons, and you're going to get right to the Community Alliance on prisons. When Kat says she's got a big list, what she's talking about is a mailing list that she uses to keep in, to keep, to reach out when uh, action is needed and participation is needed. Um, so, and then I'm at Levin at Hawaii.edu, so if you can't find her, come find me and I'll get you squared away, especially for a law student. Ashley or David, anything you'd like to say since this is coming in from a, one of your students? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm too new to say anything specifically local about Hawaii generally and Hawaii prisons, um, but certainly I, one of the things I keep hoping to see is more development of um, like a, an undergraduate criminology club on campus. Um, I'd love to see students form that. I'd be happy to be like a faculty advisor or something. 
um, just to get more students interested, because so many students are interested in criminology, criminal justice, prisons, probation, parole, um, you know, just a lot of different things. Um, so I think it would be great to to see that form. And what is the class that you're teaching? Is the class that you're teaching this semester for an undergraduate class, a graduate class? It's an what undergraduate is that class? class but, say more, say more. Uh, so currently I'm teaching advanced criminology, but the topic is prison sociology. So we go back and read um, various studies about uh, that took place within prisons as opposed to from the outside of prisons. Um, I also teach crim uh, criminology. Uh, that's the other class I'm teaching this semester. Uh, I usually teach a class on criminal justice organizations, which looks at police departments, courts, and prisons uh, from an organizational theory perspective to understand how uh, these criminal justice agencies have things in common with places like schools and hospitals and uh, corporations and things and kind of learning about them as organizations. I also teach a class on prisons that's mostly prison history and a punishment society class that's on mass incarceration. And uh, Professor David Johnson also teaches um, I'll let you see what you teach. Yeah, I, I guess I teach punishment in society. Yeah. So I'll say one thing, uh, which I tell my undergraduates on the, on, the, on the first day of class when I teach punishment in society, which is that it's important to look at punishment and just try to understand what its essence is. And the core of the concept of punishment is pain purposefully imposed on another human being. Right? That's punishment in short. And of course, when you see that, you realize you got to be careful when you do that. You know, most of the time in life, when we impose pain on another person or on an animal, we ask for a good justification for doing that. And I think a lot follows from this, from just seeing what punishment is at its core. Ashley said earlier today that we expect too much from prison. And I would I would I would agree with that, and I'd love to, to talk at more length about that, but I'll also offer you offer you a, a different but related proposition, which is that we use prison too much. And to me, that's obvious. When Justice McKenna pointed out what the numbers are, right? So do the math. Japan's incarceration rate is one seventeenth of the incarceration rate in the United States. You know, this is not a point of pride. It shouldn't be a point of pride. And that we we need to to learn to use prison less and to do other things more to address the problem that we're asking prison to address. So I'm going to, um, the mic is going to move down uh, to Professor Goto, um, Justice McKenna, Director Sakagami, and then we will wind up. Uh, you guys are okay? You're feeling, you're good? Um, we will wind up. Melissa, just in case you weren't catching it, that was Professor Ashley Rubin and David Johnson of your department. Um, so you. I'm trusting your research skills to be able to find them and take and find their classes. But thanks so much for being with us. Professor Goto. Yes, I'm thinking so um, the for education for the students. And it is easy, easier uh, to uh, go to the prison and uh, to observe. But uh, it is very difficult to what's going on the inside the society. And it's very difficult to uh, have the provision going or the, maybe the uh, ex-prisoners are uh, uh, still living in the, uh, near here. And, uh, but it is a very difficult image, and uh, we are living together. So that's a kind of key uh, for uh, the education to, uh, uh, the, to the students. And so uh, prison is uh, the prison and the prison guard or a prison warden is uh, very easy to uh, come to the uh, university to talk about uh, and also I think uh, we could bring the student, a uh, student, not student, <laughs> the, the, the student to the prison. But th that's a very important uh, for the education part. And uh, also that I want to mention that sometimes uh, uh, once I ask uh, the Minister of Justice and uh, uh, correction, uh, correction Department people and also they are 
and we were eager to introduce a new educational program into the prison. But they are worried about that they are criticized. Why you use the money uh, for the uh, private writer's uh, image? And so they are so worried about the uh, uh, people's voice. And so then we have to support them. And it's okay because the recipientism is uh, going down, uh, as uh, he always said. So then this kind of the voice is needed. And uh, uh, for the change of the situation. Thank you. While the mic is moving, I just want to sort of reiterate and amplify what Professor Goto just said, because uh, we can sort of think of it, uh, the prison, as the slice in the sandwich. Um, so the first off is what we were hearing about earlier from Dr. Polis, to never forget the social determinant, and Eleanor as well, I think, the social determinants of crime. Um, crime, and as I mean, just about every speaker today, cat's nodding her head. That that it doesn't come out of the blue, right? It comes from social systems that we can identify, and people have identified, and then we can try to address them. And so, if all we think about is punishment as the only means, then we're missing so much of the point, right? Because there may be. A so many ways to use, I don't even know where the metaphor comes from, cut it off at the pass, right? To get ahead of the game so that the crime is not happening uh, rather than jumping in. And then just as Professor Koto said, conversely on the far side, that we've got people coming out of prison, and this is very much what Dr. Bolas has been saying, we've got people on the far side. And, and, and again, many people, I know Kat was saying it, that if you're not thinking about what's happening after, um, then you're also not thinking about how to address these issues. And so, you know, it's that it's prison is probably nothing more than a thin slice of cheese between two huge pieces of bread. Um, and so we need, we don't want to forget it, but we also don't want to forget it's th those aspects of the context. So I just wanted to say it over because <laughs> it's so correct. My comment was just in response to what Melissa said, the, her question, and I, I really think that you, the undergraduates should be advocating for a development of a major in criminal justice at the University of Hawaii at Mauna Loa. It's been very uplifting uh, to participate into this uh, event, and um, I think PACT program over like 40 years is amazing. And, we have so much to learn from it. Um, but for Japanese people, it's easy uh, to kind of be um, depressing and bitter because we're not so, um, we, we, we really have difficult time just to get in the prison and do something, right? But uh, you have to rem we have to remember that the prison school, I was going to make prison circle, Almost every single person, including academics, um, uh, corrections, um, I mean, everybody uh, said, it's impossible, forget it, um, just give up. <laughs> and it took, like I repeated, but six years just to get it, uh, get the permit. But I made it through. And uh, also, last year I did this uh, rap workshop in the juvenile hall. <laughs> and everybody said impossible, but I did it. <laughs> and I'm making uh, another documentary home now. But anyway, um, and I know, I mean, the situation is very different uh, here in the States and in Japan. But still, I, I'd like to ask every single person who uh, are here and also on virtual, uh, the, how much risks can we uh, take? How um, can how much can we push uh, an individual? Right, um, no matter what position you are, where you are, what um, profession you are in, to make what we discussed the whole day. And um, I agree, every single person, uh, pretty much, to what you said today. But nobody mentioned uh, specifically about the abolition today. Um, well, it's close what David was saying, uh, asking about we have to really think about punishment. And also, Pacta, I guess you, you have the uh, um, 
the element of uh, the abolition that you discussed in the film. Um, but it's impossible uh, to um, not to have a prison, like to abolish prison at this moment. Uh, but we have to start thinking about the world without the prisons. Can we uh, think about something else um, without, I mean, except the prison? I mean, we, we are so uh, normalized, we're so accustomed to the prison and punishment, but it's all ingrained in our uh, daily lives. And, but we have to think about from different angles, different places, and uh, we have to start thinking about um, no prison kind of situation. Um, thank you. So there you have it. I said we would wrap at five o'clock. It is 5.03, close enough. Um, and uh, just once again, um, I want to thank uh, the uh, crew that has worked on this project. Uh, and I mentioned them earlier, but just wave your hands if you were a part of that. I want to thank um, our, the audience uh, in person uh, and online. Um, I want to thank um, the speakers and moderators who took the time and courage to come and speak and share these views. Um, I want to thank my collaborator here, and I want us, as uplifting as it has been, uh, yes, it, we're uplifted, but we are privileged to feel that, and therefore the responsibility that comes from that privilege on all of us, myself included, is um, to keep going um, and to keep on uh, trying to address issues, whether they're about incarceration or any matter of social justice to make this world better. So thank you to everybody for being here today, and we are powerful.